the opportunity to represent the Bailey's of Anarchy, the hill which literally and metaphorically is at the heart of Aberdeenshire. Fellow Bailey's Joe Vogelmans will be speaking on oral history and Andrew Wainwright on his research into a particular feature on the hill, while my role is to look at the recent history of Anarchy and to examine how events there relate to the community heritage scene at national level, past, present and future. We go first to Pitcoop Station, 21 miles northwest of Aberdeen. It is the 23rd of September 1889. 500 passengers have just arrived on a special train chartered by Aberdeen United Trades Council. Led by pipers, they head for Benahe, probably by Chapel of Geary and the Pictish Maidenstone, and then they head up the mountain path uh, towards the middle tap of Benahe, where they gather near the hill fort. Speeches are delivered and the picnic is enjoyed. Let's explore the origins of this extraordinary gathering and its connections to community heritage today. Our story begins in 1859 with the so-called Division of the Commonty of Benahee, which appointed the commonty to apportion the commonty to individual landowners. Benahee was not a public common in the accepted sense, but it was widely perceived to be so. The public saw its division as something akin to theft. Indeed, only last year, a local man in his 80s put it to me that the landowners spill the commonty, whatever that may mean. I think he was waiting to see my reaction, but his words do reflect a lingering popular sense of injustice. Undoubtedly, the laird in his castle could not have been the favourite person of the poor man in his cottage on Banachy, who as a consequence was required to pay rent to Colonel Charles Leslie of Balwine and Fetanir. The mansion at Fetanir contrasts dramatically with the Trafters' cottages, but the heating cost must have been enormous even when it did have a roof. Although we must not romanticise their situation, the Trafters meanwhile had insulated roofs food from crops and livestock, beet from heat for heat and cooking, and probably part-time work on local farms and estates. The transition from independent squatters to rent-paying tenants must have been harsh. But it does appear that the actual rents were proportionate to the size of the crofts, and it seems as long as the rents were paid, the crofters were allowed to stay on. Sadly, by 1878, three households were in serious arrears of rent. At Shepherd's Lodge, three generations of the Little John family were evicted, and the houses made uninhabitable. Eleven years later, Hugh Littlejohn addressed the gathering on Benahy, contrasting the independence on life, of life on the hill with the deprivations of living in the city to which he had been forced to, to move. His testimony brings together in one event the grievances replicated here and elsewhere, namely displacement of the people from the land and denial of public access. For the landowner, however, Benahy offered more income from forestry and grass shooting than he would get from the rents of the crofters. Another echo of events elsewhere. The second half of the 19th century saw intensified public concern about land, concern which embroiled not only Aberdeenshire, but commentators at home and abroad, and significantly the Westminster Parliament. It seems highly probable that the players in this debate were aware of events on Benachy and elsewhere in Scotland. The railway brought visitors to Benachy, causing tension to do with fires and the disturbance of the grouse. In 1872, a professor of history at Edinburgh, Cosmo Innes, born near Aberdeen, actually disputed the landowner's right to divide the commonty in the first place. There was widespread unrest throughout Scotland concerning land in the 1880s, and in 1884, on a speaking tour of Britain, the American philosopher Henry George was warmly welcomed in Aberdeen, and his advocacy of a land value tax is actually echoed today. Meanwhile, Aberdeen Trades Council voiced support for land reform measures, and more locally, the so-called right to Benahee. And they were in regular contact with James Bryce, MP for South Aberdeen, who promoted access to mountains bills at Westminster from 1884 onwards. Although the access bills failed, Bryce's work continued to be acknowledged in parliamentary debate almost right down to the present day in access-related discussions. Progress towards community involvement in the land, however, was hesitant in the early part of the 20th century. In 1938, for other reasons, the Forestry Commission began its purchases of land on Benahy, and from the 1960s, pressure came from more and more visitors due to an increase in car ownership. In 1973, the Baileys of Benahy was formed as an immunity group to protect the hill. The aims of the Baileys are to preserve the immunity of the hill, to help maintain the paths, to conserve the natural and cultural assets, and to encourage responsible public engagement with the hill. And the word community began to feature prominently in the terminology. So the devotion of part of the Land Reform Act to the right to buy comes up in 2003, and the Land Reform Agenda echoes Aberdeen Trades Council's 1884 motion, its return to centre stage with the Land Reform Bill currently at stage one in the Scottish Parliament. And now we have the Community Empowerment Bill as well. 
the Pan Reform Bill proposes a variety of relevant measures. Um, there'll be a Scottish Land Commission, there'll be a lack of access to information about landowners, because sometimes it's impossible to identify who they are at present. There'll be guidance to communities and a right to buy land for sustainable development. Then the Community Empowerment Act amends the sections of the 2003 Act relating to the right to buy, which were very complex. The purchase of abandoned, neglected, or detrimental land will be facilitated, which could be very significant for communities with eyesores in their midst. In their midst. And so we see an improvement of the balance between private property rights and community interests, with potential environmental benefits too. The Act therefore is required, and I've gone on ahead there. Um, the Benakee Landscapes project that emerged from the Bailey's of Benakee is a collaboration between the Bailey's, the University of Aberdeen, and community volunteers, with the support of key local landowners. And I think it's important to emphasize that in addition to the legislation, common sense cooperation between landowners, the community, and organizations can go a long way. Using your Aberdeenshire example, I hope, to, I hope I've helped to demonstrate this and how what we've been doing relates to the national picture, historically and in the present day, something from which I believe that community groups can draw, draw strength and support. And so now, this is my turn to introduce Joe Vergens on the topic of oral history, one of the strands of the Benaki Landscapes Project. The scope and the grounding of the Benaki Landscapes Project, which, as you were saying, goes back uh, partly to the founding of the Baileys in 1973, but began as a concerted research effort around 2009-2010. Um, it's been a great project to be, in, to be involved in, in that it's really drawn on the enthusiasm of people in the community, but also uh, people who are working at the university, and I count myself as both a Bailey of Benahi and I work at the University of Aberdeen as well. Um, and the part that I've been involved in, in particular, has been uh, starting to explore the oral history of uh, the landscape of Benahi. And while we've done a lot of archaeology, and it's, some of that has paralleled the story that we were hearing about a few minutes ago in Northern Ireland, um, but um, we've had some archaeology, we've had some oral history, we've had some archival research, we've had people uh, investigating the, um, the natural history of the landscape as well. And so it's been a, a multidisciplinary effort, if you like. To speak about oral history for a minute or two, um, firstly, from maybe the point of view of getting specific information about things that happened on the hill, and of course that's the strength of oral history, and we can listen out for voices that don't often get heard in other kinds of studies. Historical sources often get written by the powerful. Um, they record certain details from certain perspectives, but oral history also is good at picking up the ordinary voices of the past and the present. So although we have um, also some really good archival sources around uh, Benihi in the landscape, um, I think that, that uh, this kind of multidisciplinary effort can really, can really work in that the oral history um, explores aspects of the archaeology and the archaeology feeds into the archival research. We can really get things working together. So these pictures on the slide are just some examples of the kinds of activities we've done over the years of Benihi. Um, on the top left there, that's, that's me and one of the other uh, researchers that we've had um, we're, it's, it's part of a community event we had, um, also funded through the Arts and Humanities Research Council's Connected Communities um, Fund. And we're actually speaking on Skype with someone from uh, New Zealand. And she uh, heard about the work that we were doing, and we uh, actually got a whole internet connection installed out of Benihi there, in the visitor centre of Benihi. And at the moment, uh, she's speaking about uh, her mother, who grew up around the hill, uh, was um, went into service, into domestic service, and never actually got the, the chance to um, climb the hill itself. Um, but always thought of it, always looked at it, and when she eventually emigrated, kept stories of the hill. And then um, her daughter here is speaking to us about her visits back to the hill as, as a recollection of her family history. On other occasions, we've done uh, interviews with uh, local people who've lived for years and years, the whole lives around the hill, um, and they fed into um, the stories that we've had as well. And um, you know, in particular, that um, the uh, the uh, you know, I might go and interview someone, and then they might get enthused and interested in all in oral history, and they might then go and interview someone else. A newspaper reporter uh, recently did a little report on some of the work that we've done around the hill, and. Um, 
that story got written up in the local newspaper. Uh, again, that newspaper got sent out. Uh, there was people, again, living in New Zealand who um, took that local newspaper, the Aberdeenshire newspaper, passed it on to someone else in the community who they knew was from Benahi. He wrote a letter back to the Baileys of Benahi, and we got into correspondence, and then uh, we did an oral, hist oral history interview with him uh, as well. One of the things that came out with that was um, memories of the last residents on the Crofting colony that uh, we have some information on in, in the back there. The people who lived on the side of the hill through that process of uh, division that Colin was um, talking about a few minutes ago. And those, those memories that actually people did speak about that division, people did speak about um, the process of uh, the colonists, of the crofters being cleared off the hill. That was a really interesting story to hear. That actually gave us a sense of evidence that this just didn't just happen, it didn't just um, you know happen and nobody noticed it, nobody really talked about it. But, um, we're really getting a sense of the local significance of these events in an area that was understood as common ground. And I think for many of us, the oral history is playing into these, um, this kind of discourse of uh, making that ground common again, making that sense of the landscape um, open and available and a sense of, of, of um, common ownership, even if the legal ownership is no longer um, uh, how it has been. And of course the Forestry Commission own most of the land now and they've been great partners to work with. So um, um, where, where is this kind of taking us then? Um, just as a, as a kind of um, example, example of that. So, so we have our kind of iconic images of uh, Scottish landscape and here's Benahi um, on, on the left there and these, these are some postcards that uh, a chap who I did an oral interview, oral history interview with a few years ago. It's a collection of um, postcards of Benahi. But, but it just seems so often that our images of, of the landscape are, you know, we have a sort of domestic scene in the front and then the wild landscape um, stretching up behind us. And I think our work uh, through the, the um, oral history and the archaeology and, and other disciplines that we're working with in uh, the Benahi Landscapes Project is just shifting that, that view around a little bit. So, so, you know, our archaeological work has excavated some of the colony houses, beginning to give us a sense of looking out um, from the hill to the landscape around and looking at the activities that are actually going on on the hill itself rather than just having this picturesque sort of passive image of the landscape behind us. So many of the oral history interviews that, that we do pick up on the really small, um, almost, um, almost unnoticeable activities that people do on the hill. They just visit the hill, they walk up the hill, they eat the blaeberries, the cranberries, they appreciate the, the heather and bloom and they notice the occasional swarms of uh, flying ants and other insects that, that might be around. These tiny details that often get lost to us. Um, and indeed, the act of picnicking, just eating and, and, and um, being in the landscape through, through consuming it almost, has been one of those sort of small points that comes through uh, the oral history that, that kind of works in parallel to this bigger uh, question of politics and ownership and access to the hill that, um, that I think our project is, um, is embedded in. So I'll leave it there and I'll pass over to Andrew, who is going to describe uh, in more detail some of the, the uses of the hill that we've got. Right, I'm talking about the English quarry. It's a slightly different sort of thing that the other tour has been talking about. And here it is. Is there a pointer on this thing? Yes, it is. There's Aberdeen, there's Inverurie, and here's Benahi. And the English quarry is on the south side of that. It's lurking in the trees here somewhere. It's not a big, it's not a big feature. Uh, and this shows the uh, way it lies way up in the hills. And from here down to the sort of flatlands, is, it's, a, it's a 45 minute fast walk. It's about 200 meters up, so it's way back in the hills. This is what it looks like. It's on the side of the Gordon Way, which is one of these long distance footpaths. And from there, all you see are these spiral heaps on the side in the edge of the trees. If you go actually up in there, there's a fence to try and keep people out of it, but uh, it, it seemed better days. This is what it looks like inside. It, it's, it's long since been uh, abandoned. The history of it is a little bit sparse, but it's based very largely on this guy McConaughey, who was writing in 1890, and he is quoted as saying, upwards of 70 years since the quarry ceased to be worked. So that was meaning it was finished working in about 1820. He says it was, used, it was called the English Quarry because it was managed by an English company for production of granite blocks for building Sheerness Dockyard. Now that's on the edge of the Medway on the south side of the Thames, quite a long way away. Um, they came a long way to get that granite. The naval dockyards at Sheerness were originally built under the orders of Samuel Pepys way back, but by the end of the 1700s it was beginning to get 
to its sell-by date. So they knocked it down, and in um, 1813 to 1823, they made a new one, presumably using the blocks from uh, the English quarry. Uh, I have heard that, it, that, that the people down there have said it was built with blocks, both from Scotland and from Cornwall. So, yeah, quite likely from there. Uh, also, to get the blocks out of Benahy down to the coast would have involved uh, the Imburi Canal. They couldn't have done it before then, and that didn't open until 1805. Uh, opened regularly from 1806. Uh, so again, it fills. It, it, it's about the right sort of period of time. So the story is, it's consistent anyway. That's a picture of the naval dockyards being built about 1810. And if you see this little guy sitting on here, you can get a rough idea of how big the blocks were. They were serious blocks, They're about the size of this table. It's a porphyritic granite, and uh, for those of you who are geologists, the granite is, is feldspar and quartz and certain dark minerals. And this particular one has got these large venocrysts of feldspar in. So it's a fairly characteristic looking rock. And I'm longing to get down there to actually see whether the same type of granite does appear. Haven't done that yet. Looking at it inside, it's, it's pretty daunting. Uh, I've been past it many times, and when I heard it was used for building a dockyard, I said this little quarry couldn't possibly produce enough granite. So I looked at it a few times and then said, well, hell, let's get out there and measure it. So I uh, laid out some triangles, and this is a rough plan of the, of the quarry. It, it's a fairly basic shape. It's, a, it, it, it's ideally suited to doing some fairly simple measurements. So I measured some distances. I produced some triangles using good old trigonometry, the stuff you learned at school. Uh, I used a tape and a, and a clinometer. And for the quarry itself, I think I've got some reasonable figures. They're not accurate, but they're reasonable. They quite clearly trimmed the blocks in the quarry. Uh, you saw further back the pictures of spoil heaps in front of it. They're big slabs that have been cut off the sides to make the things roughly square. And the shape of it is very complicated. And of course, what was exported was what was dug out of the quarry and what was left behind in the, in the spoil heaps. So estimating what's in the spoil heaps was pretty important. A very rough estimate. These are my general figures. Material extracted, about 4,000 cubic meters. Material left in the spoil heap, about 1,300, meaning about 2,700 cubic meters was, was shipped out, or about 8,500 tons. That's a hell of a lot of granite to ship out. You saw where it was way up in the hill. It's an awful lot of stuff to move out. Um, but I did calculate that it is roughly enough to build a wall about three meters high a meter wide and a kilometer long. So it's the right sort of order of magnitude to make a significant contribution to uh, the Sheerness dockyards. And this is how they got it out. Here's the quarry up here. They would have shipped it out to Inveruri. First of all, on a sledge, what in my part of the world they call a puddock sledge, um, down the hill, but they couldn't do it on a cart because the poor horses just get overrun. Uh, it's, it's, it's several miles all downhill and they wouldn't manage it. But then from the bottom of the hill into Inverurie, it would be on appalling roads by horse cart, probably one block, two blocks at a time, thousands of trips into Inverurie. Uh, from there, down to Aberdeen would have been on barge, so that would have been pretty straightforward. And then from Aberdeen, of course, down to Sheerness, that was on a big ship, and uh, that, was, that was absolutely straightforward. But those poor guys up in Aberdeen, they worked jolly hard to get that stuff down to Aberdeen. So, good on them. <laughs> And so that's three different talks from the Baileys, uh, for showing the sorts of different things that we do as a group. And thank you very much from the Baileys for the <laughs>